Hello, uh, welcome to uh, uh, Building Bare Metal Tool Chains, Cross Tool and G in the Octo Project. My name is Mark Hatley. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer with uh, Xilinx, um, and I've also been involved with a lot of Yocto Project things in the past. So recently, um, I was tasked with creating a bare metal tool chain for one of our products. And um, in the past, uh, it had been always done with cross tool ng or they'd been sourced from uh, another location such as arm and um, what we were finding is that due to limited resources at times uh, we needed to be able to go and uh, have common bugs common features between the linux tool chains the bare metal tool chains and even non non linux non bare metal tool chains and so the first step in trying to unify all the software was to see about can we move from cross tool ng to a yocto project type build uh, and will this actually help us out so what i'm going to quickly go over is what cross tool ng is if you don't if you don't already know what that is if you do know just hold on with me and we'll get into the the, the meat of it a bit after that um, what the yocto project sdk builder is how this can work with uh, bare metal tool chains um, and, and this is the part that I think is, is the important part, is really my experiences with doing this. Um, how we got uh, into the Octo Project configurations for the bare metal tool chains, and then finally recommendations on if you should even do this, and if you, shouldn't, if you should or shouldn't do this, uh, when is the right time to um, consider a switch? So first off um, is cross tool ng. This is what a lot of people are using for bare metal tool chains. Uh, and when I, just to be clear, when I talk about bare metal tool chains, these are non-operating um, system specific tool chains, primarily used for bootloaders, firmware, um, things like that. And cross tool ng is an excellent way to get started building bare metal tool chains, as well as tool chains even for targeting Linux, uh, such as the Raspberry Pi and, and things like that. Latest version of cross tool ng is uh, version 1.24. Um, it's very easy to use. It has a menu config. So if you've ever configured a Linux kernel, you already know what the menu config system looks like. And you just invoke it using ct-ng menu config. And then it also has a, a very large list of um, example tool chains. And this is great for beginners who are just say, I need an ARM64 tool chain or I need a PowerPC tool chain. They can go and um, uh, look at the examples and then choose one and then uh, make any minor modifications to that. It's also very, very good at doing reproducible source builds of tool chains, so that if you have a problem or you're testing a feature or whatever, it's very easy to keep iterating over this and, and rebuilding tool chains and know that you're getting a very clear rebuild. So the other very nice thing about cross tool ng is because it's really based on the GNU uh, GCC framework, um, Everything that it builds is runtime relocatable. That means that if I build my, my bare metal tool chain for opt bare metal, and then my user installs it into opt my project, it's still going to work fine without any changes. Um, the one downside of the cross tool ng, at least in my experience, has been that the binaries become very, very specific to the host they were built on. And so what you end up doing is using an engineering practice called lowest common denominator. You find out, what operating system your users are going to be using, and then um, building for the one that's most compatible on all of those. And so for instance, if I've got users that are using Red Hat 7, Red Hat 8, um, Ubuntu, uh, Debian, um, I would probably do my builds on Red Hat 7 because it's the oldest out of the set. And if I build it there, I know it's going to work on all of the various pieces. The other issue with cross tool ng is it absolutely can build for SIGWIN and other host operating systems, but it does require that you already have a SIGWIN compiler. It's not going to build one for you as part of that build process. And so just an example of what the configuration looks like. Again, if you've ever done a Linux kernel configuration, you've already seen these, these uh, windows and how to operate them. But it's a very simple text configuration. Um, you can use graphic configuration if you want, but text configuration is the standard. And the output of this is a series of um, features, CT underscore some option. Uh, so it's used pipes, what flags you wanna add to the system, what architecture you're going to do, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and a lot of these architecture flags are specific to the architecture. Um, there's a multi-lib flag. Do I wanna create the one library I'm targeting or do I need to create multiple, multiple versions? And so in the, the work that we've done at Xilinx, we have to create multiple versions um, because 
we don't know exactly what our customer's configuration is going to be. And so we always generate multi-lib tool chains so that the customer can choose the right version for their targeted uh, application. And so when you actually run cross tool ng and start the build process, you get windows that look something like this, where it starts out and it perver perf uh, starts performing various sanity checks, various compilations, uh, everything else. And then it finally gets to the end and um, it finishes, writes out the files and tells you where it wrote out the files. And then from that point on, you can just use the tool chain or you can package it up and, and give it to somebody else that's going to use it for you. So now let's switch over to the Yocto project. Um, how is this different? Um, the Yocto project is not just focused on tool chains. Tool chains is actually quite a small part of the Yocto project, but it's a, uh, it's a very ne uh, necessary part of the Yocto project. And so the Yocto project itself is really a full distribution build environment. Um, so everything starts with a distribution configuration. You have log local project configurations, and then you have machine or target configurations. This combination of configurations actually defines what you want to build and how you want to build it. And then it does it through a standard mechanism. Um, the Octo project, while Linux is its main focus, is not actually Linux specific. And so you can absolutely build bare metal, free RTOS, open amp. Um, we've seen other things being built with it that's, that's fairly interesting sometimes. Um, the outputs of the Octo project um, primarily are runtime images for users, so disk images, but they don't have to be. And so you can build an SDK, which is the traditional tool chain that uh, cross tool and G would type, uh, be creating, or you can build what's called an ESDK which is um, not only a tool chain, but it's also the full build environment so that you can make modifications to it uh, or the applications that were built with it and then regenerate them. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm really only talking about the SDK because it's really the mapping that, that matches closest to what cross tool and can do. And so as I said with the, the, um, before is the Octo Project SDK is that mapping, and there's really a couple of different ways that the, the Yocto Project SDK itself can be defined. Um, there is a target SD, targeted SDK. What this is, is I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to build a Linux operating system. I want all of these things in my Linux operating system. Oh, and build me an SDK that, I, that you know will allow, allow my users to create applications for that. So you're not really defining the SDK, you're letting the system define it. And then there's a secondary one, which again is, going back is, is really the one I'm talking about, which is called a defined SDK. This is really where the SDK um, is specified component by component by component. I must have binutils, I must have GCC, I must have new lib, I must have lib gloss, uh, things like that. And then of course the SDKs can be multi-lib enabled. And the Yocto project and cross tool ng do handle multi-libs a little bit differently. Um, so that, actually there was a question in the chat. Let me answer that quickly because I think this is a good time to do it. Uh, what give, what's an example of modifications you can make with an ESDK? Um, so for bare metal, I'm really not sure if it's a good use case. But for the general case, um, the ESDK would allow you to, say, change a new lib and then regenerate your tool chain. Uh, it would allow you to change, um, if you're doing Linux build, an application. I want to make a, a configuration change to my security modules. And then you'd be able to make that configuration change and move on from that. So the Octo Project SDK output of it uh, is a self-extracting. This is a .sh file, but it's really a self-extracting shell script. Um, and the nice thing about this is inside of that extracted archive is really an entirely self-contained SDK environment. And when I say self-contained, that means it provides its own glibc, its own runtime components, everything required for those applications and libraries to work properly. The SDK can also build um, cross compilers for SIGWIN and other environments as needed. So if you're building an SDK to target SIGWIN from your Linux machine, you don't have to provide a SIGWIN uh, compiler. All you have to do is say, I want the output to be SIGWIN. It'll say, oh, I also need to build a SIGWIN uh, compiler. And so those two items itself um, eliminate one of the downfalls of what I saw in the cross tool ng, which is I don't have to focus on most common denominator anymore. And I don't have to have a magic SIGWIN uh, compiler somewhere to point uh, cross tool ng at. However, there is a downside to what the Octo project does compared to cross tool ng, and that's that automatic relocation. The SDK itself, because of providing all of the environment components, 
actually has things referenced and configurations linked to the installation location. And so if you change that installation location, it can no longer find the glibc version that it came with or some of the other runtime components that it came with. And so the sacrifice is you lose the automatic runtime relocation in the normal Yocta Project SDK. Um, for a lot of users, this really isn't a big deal. Um, but I do know that uh, for some corporate users, they like to have IT install it in an NFS share, and then the users mount that NFS share in random places. If everybody mounted that NFS share to the same exact path that uh, it was the original install was on, it would work just fine. It's really only when the path uh, changes. So an example of the Yocto project build environment. Um, the first thing that we always do is we run an OENet build env. This sets up the runtime environment. Uh, we can then edit our configuration files under the conf directory, primarily conf uh, slash local.conf, or we can pass some of these things in on the command line. And so uh, in the example here, I'm passing in that I want to build a Xilinx standalone distribution, which is something that I defined. I want the machine to be my microblaze toolchain definition, and then I'm going to build my meta toolchain. And my meta toolchain is that defined SDK. And the results of that is what you see in the window on the right, is I have a whole bunch of things building all at once. And you may not be able to see it on your screen, but there are about 7,000 tasks that it's going to execute. Um, if, if you compare this against CrossToolNG doing exactly the same build, uh, CrossToolNG does significantly less work. Um, some of this is because of the way the Octo project is defined. Some of it is actually because of um, uh, there are additional safety systems built into the Octa project to prevent contamination between multi-libs. And so if uh, that magic uh, Xilinx standalone uh, configuration, I pulled out some of the relevant um, uh, configuration lines just to kind of show you what they are. Uh, the first thing that we want to do is we actually want to define what is this distribution. Um, and from that definition, you can see that uh, it's Xilinx standalone. We've got a version number so that we can change that if necessary. We have a target uh, vendor. That way we know that this is tagged specifically for Xilinx. Um, if you're another company, you just put your company name in, or if it's a product, you put your product name in. We set up our uh, libc to be new lib because for bare metal, that's generally what, what you end up using even if you don't actually use new lib for your compilation. And then uh, we wanted to have a very specific version. Uh, uh, SDK version is embedded in the name of the SDK file that is generated. And so we wanted to be very clear that this was called Xilinx standalone so that there wasn't any confusion with anything maybe ARM would ship or that we've shipped in the past or, or whatever. So that's kind of where those variables come from. Um, I also needed to say that we needed to have specific static libraries. By default, the Octa project generally does not install static libraries into an SDK. And this is primarily for license contamination reasons on most full operating systems, you don't really want to use static libraries. Um, but that, do, that does not hold true for bare metal. So that's where the uh, libc dependencies comes in. Uh, we also need to clear some normal defaults. Um, I won't go over those too much. Uh, that'd be something that uh, if you're really curious why we have to do that, um, ask me in Slack afterwards or ask on the Octa Project mailing list and I'm happy to help you out and explain this a little bit more in detail. And then uh, finally, for uh, MinGW, we actually found an issue with bare metal tool chains that we have to very, very specifically say, I have to have the pthreads library in order for this to work from MinGW. And so that's where the very last line comes in. So it's really a workaround for, for probably a bug. Um, and those items, those bug workarounds are going to go back upstream as I continue to do my work. So the second piece of it then is this microblaze tool chain configuration. How do I actually define a configuration that has all of the multi-libs in it that I need? And this configuration is very much extreme. Um, this is not a typical Yocto project thing, but this is something that we needed because uh, for the Xilinx Microblaze, I think we have defined 48 configuration, 48 multi-libs right now, but if you actually do the, conf uh, the combinatorial on it, it's well over 100 that, that are possible to configure. And that's all because the Microblaze is an FPGA um, dynamic uh, or uh, software processor, software as opposed uh, uh, that it's running on the FPGA. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to set a variable called multi-lib global variance. This is basically, these are all of the, the multi-lib variants that are, that are allowed in the system. 
by default, multi-lib global vari variance is very simple, and it's just um, uh, 32 and 64. But that's not really what we're defining in this case. What we're defining is things like um, MBLE, MBS, uh, BS, uh, MBP, and on and on and on. And then you can even see the last one there, which is quite a complex, uh, which is MB microblaze, LE little Indian, M64, 64-bit, uh, BS, um, which is the uh, uh, barrel shift. Um, and then it's MF, which is a hardware floating point unit. And I don't even remember what the PD part is at the end. So you can see that there's quite a few things. For each of the configurations, we then need to define exactly what our default tune is. If the default tune is already defined within the Octo project, then I can just set default tune equals and leave it at that. I don't have to set any of the other things. Microblaze though is unique because it is a configurable processor. There really are no default tunes uh, defined. And so I have to manually define each one of these. And in this example, you can see the base one is simply microblaze. And all we're doing is saying, this is a big Indian microblaze with no additional features, and that's it. And then we define a little Indian version. And then we define a barrel shift version, which is really a big Indian with barrel shift. And if you keep looking down the file, then there's a little Indian barrel shift and on and on and on. So with the Yocta project, um, what actually, changes uh, compared to cross tool and G or compared to how, how we used to build this stuff. Um, one of the biggest things that we found is that cross tool and G has a very different set of default um, arguments for uh, bin utils. And so when I say default arguments, this is uh, configure arguments. Uh, this is the way that patches are applied and some things like that. So we had a lot of work to do to reconcile this. It turns out in the end that this really wasn't a cross tool and G issue. It's really a whoever defined that configuration for cross tool ng. Um, they set a whole bunch of things, and the reason they set these things has kind of been lost to history. Um, they either don't work for Xilinx anymore, or they were an open source person. And it all made sense at the time, but it was never really tracked why a specific option was set. And the Octo project's been very good at reevaluating these options over time and removing ones that don't make sense anymore. And we had exactly the same behavior with GCC. Um, and uh, one of the things that the Octo project typically does was that it builds um, GCC multiple times, uh, one for each multi-lib. And for our bare metal, we didn't want that behavior. It was for 48 multi-libs, that's insane. And so we actually had to put a patch into the system that builds GCC once, turns on the multi-lib configuration option in GCC itself. but it actually creates all sim links as the alternative names. That way we preserve the Yocto project interfaces, but we only build it once. And it doesn't so much save um, build time, but it definitely saves disk space. It's, uh, it's significantly smaller. Uh, we also had to uh, re-enable some previous options in GCC for the new lib configuration. Uh, the default new lib configuration in the Yocto project um, for whatever reason, isn't compatible with some of the things that we've done in the past. And we needed to make sure that the compatibility was, was kept. I'm unfortunately not a new lib expert by any means. So I'm going by what other people have told me on this, that they basically said, no, 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 you have to have this option set or it's not going to work properly. And then finally, the new lib lib gloss, we did have to adjust the workaround, uh, the defaults. We also had to add some code to the Octa project to deal with multi-lib conflicts. This is code that I do intend to submit back to the Octo project. Um, I'm working on updating to the current version of the Octo project right now. And as that work uh, gets further along, I'll actually have patches that, that can go to the master version of the Octo project. And then um, there was also an issue where libgloss newlib just always assumed that because they weren't multi-lib, that only one single dependency was fine. Uh, but the Octo project has multi-lib dependencies as well. So I had to teach the the libgloss and newlib, those multi-lib dependencies. So let's take a, a quick look at the difference between them just based on up to this point. So cross tool ng is very easy to configure. Um, it's functionally limited to tool chains. Um, host, uh, operating system dependencies, runtime relocation is great in it. It does exactly what a lot of people want. Uh, MinGW is definitely there, but it does require that external compiler. On the Yocta project side, though, um, 
We have sample configurations for Linux, but bare metal is very limited. So I had to figure most of this out myself. Um, I would not call it easy. Uh, for toolchain side, I think that um, it's, it, well, it's capable of doing a lot more than toolchains. For the purpose of this comparison, though, they're basically functionally equivalent. Um, the Yocta project, though, does have that host operating separation, but at the expense of then the, the installed tool chains are no longer runtime relocatable. They're installed time relocatable, but not runtime relocatable. And then finally, it will automatically generate anything needed for the uh, MinGW output. So let's get in some, some further experiences on this. Um, so now transitioning from cross tool and G to the Okta project SDK, uh, I'll recap why we had to do this it really was unifying the source code. And a lot, of, a lot of people questioned it when I first brought this up inside the company. Well, why do we have to do this? Bare metal is a very different use case than the Linux use case. And very soon after the project was started, we actually ran into a really good example on why this helps. Um, we had somebody that was trying to debug bare metal tool chains and the debugger hit a certain instruction and failed. And they really didn't know why it failed they could use the Yocto project bare metal tool chain and the instruction did not fail. And it turns out it was a combination of Yocto project configuration and a patch that was in the Yocto project to fix a Linux bug. And it just so happened that that Linux bug also affected bare metal, but for whatever reason had never been backported to the Xilinx cross tool and G version of, the, of this GDB. And so by creating it, uh, by ensuring that we're using the same source code, generally speaking, we're both bug and feature compatible now. And so if somebody fixes one problem, they're probably fixing it in both uh, systems. And so it, it really proved the point that we saved a bunch of engineering time by unifying our, our source code base. But the transition was not painless. We anticipated that it would probably take two, maybe three weeks um, to do the transition. It took three months. Um, now, to be clear, this wasn't three months of me working on it constantly, but it was three months of iteration. So it took two to three weeks to do the first version of it. Then I handed off that to the test team and the team doing bare metal, and it passed. And then people started to use it, and they found that there were certain things that were not working properly. And so we iterated another one and another one and another one. And by the time uh, we had everything stable or better than the previous version that we'd started with, it was about three months of iteration. Now that we've transitioned to the Octo project, I, I don't expect anything major from a maintenance standpoint or anything uh, that would be more difficult than cross tool and G. But I did track down one of the reasons why some of this transition and maintenance was difficult. And that's really because um, people didn't understand why certain uh, multi-libs were enabled. People didn't understand why certain arguments were set in cross tool and G or the, or I guess cross tool and G primarily a little bit in the Octo project, um, but at least on the Octo project side, I was able to ask people who made those decisions, hey, why is this thing turned on? But on the cross tool and G side, because it, um, and, I, and I'm not talking about the cross tool and G community, just to be clear. I'm talking about the people who did the integration five, six years ago and Silex. Some of them were not there anymore. Some of them said, oh, because we were told to do it. And they really didn't understand why those options were set. Um, if the components that I was using were coming from the cross tool and G community, I actually expect that their support, their, their help would have been a lot, a lot better. Um, but internally, it was very difficult. There's also um, a, a belief that because the tool chain worked, the only thing they had to do was upgrade the source code. They didn't upgrade cross tool and G. Um, and in fact, the version of cross tool and G we were using was about two and a half, three years old. And so that added some complications to the configurations. That added some complications to the transition. Um, it's, so these are all the things that you have to be aware of. And it's really easy to yeah, cross tool and G or Yocto project or even your own build systems to simply say, it works. I don't want to touch it anymore. I'm only using it for bare metal. I don't need the latest tool chain. And then three years later come and you do have to upgrade for a new feature or a bug fix or something, and then find that you don't have what you need in order for it to work properly. So definitely something to be aware of. Um, then, uh, and again, the initial goal on this for ARM, I mostly talked about Microblaze up to this point, but for ARM was simply to, uh, to make sure that we were compatible. Um, one of the things though that was required for our ARM work is we actually had to have runtime relocation capable system. 
And so what we ended up doing is creating a script that wrapped all of the executables on the system, uh, found out what the runtime location was of the script, and then called the actual binary with all of those environment variables uh, set properly and all the other components. So runtime relocation is possible, but I don't recommend it. It really is a hack. Um, so I've got a link here. Um, so you can actually see the full version of our uh, configurations. Uh, this is the ARM configuration that I have listed here, but I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of how I I'd call it insane our configuration is and why this is probably not the right way to do it long term. Um, but it was a way for us to do the transition, and now we can focus on what do we actually need out of this and bring this down. And so what we started with was a configuration that was based on the work that ARM, ARM provided us uh, and had 17 multilibs defined inside of GCC itself. And you can do a, a print multilibs in order to find out what the multilibs available in any given toolchain are. And I'm not going to list them all here, but there's a big combination between standard ARM 32-bit, uh, v5, v6, v7, floating point, no floating point, um, and then uh, some 32-bit ARM v8, and also some additional custom configurations that we found. And, and what I went back to my team for is I said, OK, we have 17 things here defined. I don't, and I'm a relatively new person to Xilinx. And I said, I don't think anybody at Xilinx has ever released an ARM v5. Um, do we need the ARM v5 tool chains? And the answer was nobody knows. Um, so this again is the, somebody originally said, well, this works. I'm just going to leave the configuration. I'm not going to change it. And then ARM provided it to us. And ARM says, well, they still have ARM v5s and 6s and 7s and everything else out there. So from an ARM, uh, ARM perspective, they are needed. But from Xilinx perspective, I don't think they actually are. And so we needed to, so the next iteration of this is I'll work with the team to actually start filtering those 17 multilibs down. My goal is to really get down to about 10 multilibs. Uh, we'll see if that happens. The other piece was that the ARM configuration comes with switches that are simply not applicable to Xilinx products. Um, primarily things to work around um, errata, uh, things like that. And when I investigated the errata, it was very clear that they, they don't apply to Xilinx products, or at least they don't apply to anything that's modern. And so I went and I said, can we turn these things off? And after quite a long discussion, the answer is finally, yeah, we can. And it turns out that I wasn't really turning them off. I was refusing to turn them on because the Okta project did not use those errata switches. Because as far as the Okta project knows, all modern ARM processors don't have those errata. It was really old stuff or pre-production stuff. Um, the next tool chain that came in was the uh, ARM R, R and M profiles. These are the real-time and microcontroller profiles. Um, so there were 22 multilibs defined here. And if you look at the uh, data sheets, at least for the products that I was working on, it's really um, simply an ARM, uh, R, I don't remember now, it's, I think R5F is the, uh, the one I needed to target. But why do we have all of the rest of these things listed here? And again, it goes back to the same thing. Do I actually need these? Probably not, but our first goal was simply compatibility. Uh, and then we'll work on bringing these down. So my goal is so, uh, within the next year, hopefully weed this uh, 22 multilibs down probably into five or six. Um, uh, one thing though that we did have to do is we did actually uh, have to define a custom uh, tune called ARM RM because the Yocta project did not already have a uh, an ARM R or M profile configuration, but it had all of the rest of them. Uh, ARM64, this was easy, very easy. We wanted to have two multilibs defined, um, which is basically a 32-bit and a 64-bit, uh, sorry, two 64-bits, a, a regular 64-bit and a 64-bit ILP32 variant. Um, with the uh, the way that our processors are, are defined and everything else, um, the big little uh, A72, A53 combination um, tune was actually the right tune for us. And so this one was just as simple as me saying, yep, this is what we're going to do. Everybody else said, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Because everybody, because we only had two multilibs, it's really easy for them to verify. This is really easy to do. And it doesn't have that 10, 15 year legacy of uh, people having cha made changes in configurations. So this was the easy one. 
And then we've got the um, microblaze. And this is where I said before, there's 48 multilibs defined, but there's actually more than 48 permutations possible in this configuration. Um, microblaze, if, if you're not aware of that, is um, functionally similar to a lot of the RISC-V uh, stuff, I, in my opinion, where it's a software, primarily a software-defined processor that you can turn on and off instructions, but those instructions are defined in the compiler. So all you have to do is tell the compiler, I have a barrel shift unit or I don't have a barrel shift unit. And so that's where it, what leads to these permutations. And in this case, all of the microblaze stuff was Xilinx specific. Um, some of it was upstream, but but from a cross tool and G standpoint, a tool chain standpoint, it really is a, a Xilinx thing. Um, so we move over to the uh, barrel configurations and what we defined uh, as part of our 2020.1 release was this meta Xilinx standalone layer. And then inside of that, we actually have patches. Uh, one of the patches was for bin utils. We had to disable gold as the linker. We had to disable gprof, shared libraries. We did have to enable uh, link time optimization because some of the microblaze systems that we do are very memory limited. Um, we had to en enable static configurations as well as multi-libs. For ARM, we had to uh, uh, make sure that uh, enable inner work was defined. And then microblaze, we had to disable this in it finny array. And these are things in both the enable inner work and the, the disable in Infinian uh, array, they actually came from the cross tool and G configurations. GCC side, very similar, enable new lib, turn off other things, enable other things. Um, we had to set some defaults. Uh, I'm trying to say if there's anything important here. Um, I think the, the one from Microblaze, and this was part of what took us three months uh, to figure out was we missed the disable in, uh, in Infinity Array in the GCC configuration. It was defined properly in bin utils, but not in GCC. We just missed it. And so what we were finding is that software would run, and then when it got um, to uh, an, an exit, all of a sudden the software might crash. Not always, but it might crash. And it turned out in the end, it was because the, uh, we had missed that one argument. And it took a lot of back and forth, uh, looking at the cross to one g configuration, looking at the Octo project configuration, really synchronizing them. Okay. And then um, new lib lib gloss. This is probably one of the places that this work is uh, probably very Xilinx specific. Um, Xilinx implements our uh, hardware drivers, not as part of lib gloss, but in something called libzil, XIL for Xilinx. Um, so we need, needed to build new lib and lib gloss in order to build the tool chain. And then we replace parts of libgloss with libzil later on. But in order to be able to do that replacement, we had to make sure that libgloss and newlib were both compiled with exactly the same options. And the one that was causing us significant problems because um, again, I'm not a newlib expert and didn't realize it, was this disable, disable newlib supplied syscalls. Uh, what happens is without that set, newlib will supply the basic system syscalls um, even though libgloss or something like libgloss is really supposed to supply it. And so you run into a clash where things sometimes won't link, or if they link, the wrong version of the library will actually be used, or the uh, wrong version of the function will be used. And so we learned the hard way that it's that disable new lib supplied syscalls. And then finally, that multi-lib configuration. There's a very simple workaround to add the dependencies, um, but it's something that I think needs to go back upstream. But until I get uh, everything working on master, uh, I don't have a, a specific patch to send up because it's possible this stuff has been fixed in master already in the Octo project. So let's take a look at the lessons learned. The more multi-libs, the longer the project parse time is. With um, I, I tried to provide a table here that, that showed parse time, compilation time, things like that, and compared against cross tool and G. This is a very, very simple configuration that I'm doing a comparison against. If you don't have a simple configuration, the parse time can blow up exponentially, just as a warning. Um, so Microblaze, which is by far the very worst um, configuration with 48 multi-libs, it took eight minutes to parse the simple configuration. Um, and cross tool and g doesn't have that parsing time at all, so there really wasn't a, a cost there. And the compilation time was a lot higher because it's doing more work to ensure each of the multi-libs is completely separate from each other and then combining them in the end. And so from a time and resource perspective, the Octa project is a lot more expensive than cross 2 g for doing something like this. 
Um, if I turn on other components of the system, which are absolutely not used by any of these configurations, my parse time exploded to 48, 50 minutes. And that was before the compilation started. And this is all on a reasonably fast modern machine, 32 cores, or sorry, 16 cores, 32 threads, um, with 128 gigs of RAM. So this isn't a small machine. And so you can kind of see that the trade-off in time to build and parse and everything else, um, you have to be able to justify that by having either a one common Yocto project interface, uh, one common user interface, or one common set of source code. If you can't justify that, this work is probably not worth it. So my recommendations here. For a quick tool chain, firmware users, BIOS developers, um, I want to build U-Boot, uh, all of those things. Cross tool and G is far quicker, far easier to use. Just keep that in mind. If anybody has a question and ever asks me, should I use cross tool and G or Yocta project? First question is, what are you doing with it? And I'll probably say cross tool and G unless they have a very specific Yocta project use case. So one of the other nice things that you can do with the Octo project, and we started to look at this, um, was you can actually use the exact same source code with the Octo project, just use the same patches and integrate them. But what we found was between the configuration switches and the desire to have a common set of source code um, with cross tool and, uh, uh, sorry, a common set of source code within the Octo project, we ended up basically dismissing uh, cross tool and G source code completely. And then we focused on the configuration switches to make sure that they were configured properly. And over time, we're going to get those configuration switches closer to the Octo project than closer to what the previous cross to g configurations were. Um, but it's a transition strategy. Um, for the Octo project itself, uh, I found that it was easiest if I have to create a Sigwin uh, tool chain. Um, since Windows is moving towards uh, more of that Linux environment for Windows, hopefully maybe Sigwin won't be necessary much longer. Um, that's my hope. And then if that's the case, then the advantage of the Octo project kind of goes away, which I'm, I'm perfectly fine with. Um, and then finally, which I've said mul multiple times, the Octo project absolutely takes more time and takes more effort, especially if you are not um, familiar with some of these, these switches and configurations. But it, once you have it figured out, um, it becomes very reproducible and you have a common set of source code and configuration switches with Linux. And so it may simplify your defect handling, your feature fixes, um, creating new features for your tool chains, integrating those new features, and even testing those features. And so it's just something to be aware of that the penalty for the more complex system may be worth it for your use case. Um, I believe that for my use case, it is worth it. Uh, but if I was just going to build a tool chain, I would absolutely use cross tool and G for that. So that's kind of where, where I stand. And with that, I'm open for questions. Um, I see that there's a question. I've already answered one. Uh, let's take a look at another one. Um, so somebody asked about Vivado Eclipse SDKs using Yocta project um, components. I am not involved at all with the Vivado stuff, um, but our bare metal tool chains that I was creating for this is uh, what Vivado and um, our Vitus products use. Uh, primarily for building firmwares, just to be clear, not the Linux side. The Linux uh, tool chains are also provided by my group, but they they are loaded into the Vivado Vitus and come from the Octo project specifically for this. But I don't know much about the rest of it, how it's integrated, sorry. Um, question, what methods did you use to determine what to enable and disable in the configurations? Uh, we used two different methods. One, we actually queried um, GCC on both sides and use the various print options, the spec file print options, things like that, and we started comparing things. Our initial goal was to identify the configurations and then see what was different between the Octo project things. For multi-libs, that was easy. It's print, print multi-libs. For the configuration stuff, um, there is a print version that will print some of the configurations for the spec file things. Again, we'll print some of the spec file. We could start there and start looking at that. We also looked at the configuration log from the cross tool and G builds. And by looking at those logs, we were able to see, oh, it passed the following arguments into uh, configure for bin utils or GCC. And then I looked at those same configuration logs on the Octo project and did that same comparison. And so back and forth, we, we started to do that. 
Um, Richard, uh, good question. I forgot to mention this. He asked which Yocta project release was all of the, were all of these things computed against? And this was against the Zeus release, which is the 3.0 release from last fall, the October timeframe release. Um, we are working towards doing master right now, but I do not yet have uh, the toolchain components upgraded to the latest master version of the toolchain. Uh, so I don't know if the parsing or the um, or the compilation is any faster. I think the parsing will be faster just from other project stuff that I've done, but I don't have any numbers to actually back that up. It might just be, it, it, it's the same. I don't expect it to be any slower, just to be clear. Um, next question was, ha, ha, how about build root? Have we used it? I have not used build root in many years. Um, and because Xilinx is focused on Yocto project, uh, primarily for our Linux, um, embedded Linux uh, offerings, Peta Linux. Um, I, I focused on Yocto project. I am. I would not be surprised that build root can do a lot of what I've talked about, especially with bare metal tool chains. But I just don't have any experience there to say either way if it if it's usable. Uh, next question: um, Describe how the bare metal tool chains can work with OpenAMP. Um, so again, I'm not an OpenAMP expert. Uh, or I, I know what it is. Um, I actually work with people who I have given tool chains to, to work on OpenAMP, and they said it just worked. Um, as far as debugging goes, uh, that I don't know how they're doing debugging. I'm guessing it's with JTAG, but I really don't know. Um, most of the bare metal stuff that I have done in the past on both ARM processors and other CPUs has almost always been JTAG based. Uh, so I don't know specifics about Xilinx. I've never done any actual JTA, uh, uh, bare metal application development here at Xilinx. So I'm not, I'm not familiar with their tooling. Um, performance specs on the previous slide seem to be parsed, uh, was potentially disk bound. Um, so the machine that I ran those numbers on uh, has two disks in a RAID 1. Uh, it is spinning media. And so it very well could be disk bound. Um, but what I was finding though, is even if it's disk bound, the amount of work that the Yocta project was doing in comparison with cross tool and G was significantly more work. Um, so even if the Yocta project was 84 minutes, in fact, I'll go back to that slide. Um, so even if the Yocta project was 84 minutes on Microblaze and it was disk bound and cross tool and G was 32, I would not expect, even with the fastest RAM disks, for the uh, Yocta project stuff to be any faster than about 50 minutes. Um, I've done things in the past uh, with, with RAM disks compared to hard drives in, in RAID 1, and I found that it's uh, RAM is a much bigger deal. And with 128 megs of RAM, uh, sorry, 128 gigs of RAM, I never got close to a RAM threshold on the system. I watched this the whole time. And I did get load averages in the four and 500 range, um, but my RAM usage never went above about 80, 80 gigabytes. And so I wasn't bound from a RAM. I was never swapping anything like that. And so I, I think these numbers are representative. They're obviously not gonna be perfect though. Uh, next question, why did I choose multi-lib over multi-config? Um, the the plain answer was that uh, the previous con um, configurations and the Vitus and Vivado products were expecting a multi-lib configuration with one uh, GCC binary to execute that would then pick the correct library, the correct uh, configuration arguments, and just run it. Um, the current integration does not know how the Yocto project environment files work. It does not know how the Yocto project configuration components work. It's focused purely on, I want to run GCC. If I pass in these options, I know the right library is going to get loaded by GCC and linked together. And so that's why multi-lib was used over multi-config. Um, but even in the future, I don't know that I'm necessarily going to change this. Um, like I said, my, my main thing is to clean up the multi-libs. 48 is insane, 22 is insane, 17 is insane. There's really no reason for that many of them. What we need to do is identify that these are the ones that are common. These are the ones that people actually use and bring those numbers down. And not only is that going to make it easier from a compilation standpoint, but it's going to make it easier from a support standpoint. And that's actually what I'm more worried about is the support side of things. If somebody files a bug, do I have to spend an hour to reproduce a binary toolchain 
just so that I can say, yeah, there's a bug there and then pass it off to a tool chain expert or somebody like that. Um, if I only have to build two, two multi-libs, I can spend 15, 20 minutes building a tool chain doing the same thing. And then I don't feel like I'm wasting my time. Uh, and then of course, the more multi-libs, the more chance you have for bugs in those multi-libs. So it's, it's trade-offs that we have to worry about. For the multi-config stuff, um, we do plan on using that for um, multiple operating systems. So depending on if multi-config can be used for SDKs and ESDKs, uh, what we may do is be able to provide a single tool chain that will now work on bare metal and Linux. And then you would choose, I want the bare metal tool chain or I want the Linux tool chain, uh, something like that. And so that could be a very good use of the multi-config. Um, but up to this point, everything's been bare metal based because the Linux tool chains were already Octo project based and they just worked. So we didn't make any changes to them. Let's see any other questions? So that's all the questions I've gotten so far. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Okay, I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, so I will be on the Slack uh, embedded track channel, uh, as well as I'm on the uh, Yocto uh, uh, channel as well. Um, you can certainly reach me uh, from, uh, uh, it's mark.hatle at kernel.crashing.org uh, if you've got any questions or on the uh, Yocto project IRC. Uh, I'm Frey there, F-R-A-Y. So thank you very much. Thank you for attending. Again, any questions, please let me know. Thank you.